On behalf of the New York Wine and Great Foundation, we welcome you to New York Wines Online, a Cab Franc state of mind with Kevin Zraeli. While we wait for everyone to get logged in, we would like to review a few logistical details. If you find yourself with streaming issues, please limit other internet users in your office or household. You may need to close all other open browsers, or you may also find it helpful to log out, log back in with Firefox or Chrome. We have two forms of communication for today's webinar. We have the chat and the Q&A sections. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other attendees. Be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down to field as it can default to panelists only. Additionally, we have the Q&A section. This is a way for you to ask questions of our on-screen panelists. If you'll please be sure to enter any questions for the panelists into the separate Q&A section, we will do our best to get to all of your questions at the end of the session. Today's webinar is being recorded and streamed to Facebook Live and will be available to all attendees after the webinar. To begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce you to Kevin Zraeli. Kevin is an award-winning wine writer and one of the world's foremost wine educators. Kevin has been teaching wine for over 50 years, sharing his passion with thousands of eager students from all walks of life. He has written eight books about wine and food, including his annually updated Windows on the World Complete Wine Course, which has sold more than 4 million copies, making it the number one wine book in the United States. Kevin is the youngest person to receive the James Beard Lifetime Achievement Award, recognized for his commitment to making the study of wine accessible and fun for all. And we look forward to having Kevin do just that with us today. Kevin, I'd like to introduce you on the camera here and have the, you uh, take the mic. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for all uh, who are joining us, the, the winemakers, the owners, and all of the press, and other people that we've invited to the tasting. Uh, thank you for bringing that thing up about the wine teaching. I've actually been teaching wine for 50 years. It will be 1971, 50 years ago, but I learned everything about wine uh, here in New York, and I'm living in uh, the Hudson Valley which they say uh, is the uh, 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 oldest wine growing region in the United States. As a matter of fact, when we get, to, uh, is Matt here? Is Yancey here? Where are, where are all my guests? Uh, Aaron, uh, Kareem, are you guys on with me? Come on on, let me see your, see what you look like. Everybody wants to see everybody here. Uh, anyhow, um, when I started studying 50 years ago, the first winery I went to uh, was Ben Marl. And we're gonna start off with Matt here in a second. But uh, the whole thing about Cabernet Franc, uh, what is it? Uh, and that's what I want to find out today. You know, what 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 makes it uh, uh, tick? Uh, is it is it more of a Cabernet Sauvignon style? Is it more of a Pinot Noir style? Uh, is it how do you how do you have to what clonal selections do you have to have? What kind of soil is the best? These are questions that I have that I'm hoping that everybody else uh, will, will will chime in here. Uh, although Jansen's Robinson, I'm saying this right now because I don't want to get accused of anything. She called uh, the feminine side of Cabernet Sauvignon is what Cabernet Franc is. And then I also heard another uh, person say, well, they used to compare it to Cabernet Sauvignon, a lighter Cabernet Sauvignon. And then they said, nah, you know what? It's more like a spicy Pinot Noir. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we've all seen Sideways. I hope I thought it was a requirement for all of us to see the movie Sideways. Uh, and of course, Miles or Paul Giamatti, uh, as we all know, I don't, I don't even have to ask you right now, his favorite grape. Come on, you can do it. Anyone want to put it down here? I'm looking at all you people participating here right now. Use your fingers and type away. Okay. Pinot Noir, of course, and uh, and the grape he, he hated the most was Merlot. And of course, the scene in Sideways is uh, he goes after he finds out his uh, ex-wife is now a child outside of a church. If you can remember that scene, he goes in, into his wine cellar, which is the which is the, uh, the where all the shoes are in his apartment, throws out the shoes and finds his bottle of Chateau Cheval Blanc, uh, 1961. And I always found that interesting because uh, obviously there's no Pinot Noir in it. Uh, good, good screenwriting there right now. But uh, that 61 Cheval Blanc, Chateau Cheval Blanc, was 58% Cabernet Franc and 42% Merlot. So uh, Bordeaux is where I, I think uh, the third sibling, if you will, Merlot being number one, Cabernet Sauvignon being number two, and Cabernet Franc being the little brother or sister to those. Uh, but of course, in the Loire Valley, but all around the world now, I'm seeing Cabernet Franc. And I just want to make my first statement here, and then I'm going to start off with Matt. 
on my first statement, maybe my last statement is, I believe that Cabernet Franc is the future of New York State wines. And we, you guys can uh, agree or disagree, the future. Uh, I mean, we make some great wines here in New York, but as uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is to Napa or, or, or uh, Malbec is to Men Men Mendoza or um, Sangiovese is to Tuscany, I totally believe that New York State uh, can produce the, the red grape will be Cabernet Franc. And I can say this because I've tasted them from the Finger Lakes, tasted them from Long Island, tasted them uh, uh, from the Hudson Valley, tasted them up in Niagara. And the wines that I see here right now, it's not just potential, they're already there. So what I'm gonna ask my panelists to start off with is what is Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Franc? I mean, if you can give me like a quick sentence, Matt, if you can start us off with that, Matt, Ben Morrow Vineyards, uh, as I said, the first winery I ever went to back in 1970, I think it was, so 51 years ago. And I can assure you, there was no Cabernet Franc there. Is that correct, Matt? I do not believe so, not then. Um, but yeah, kind of going back to um, what you mentioned about, uh, you know, New York State is a very diverse state uh, when it comes to grape growing. Um, you know, people think New York wine, you throw it all in the same barrel, but, you know, the, the conditions on the North Fork compared to the Finger Lakes and here in the Valley are, are so different. But I do think that Cabernet Franc um, adapts well uh, to terroir. Uh, in that sense of, um, you know, certain varieties, once they're outside of their super ideal climactic soil conditions, um, they get wonky, where Cab Franc can just be expressed in so many different beautiful ways, whether it's, um, you know, rosés to, you know, some lighter kind of uh, more gentle extraction reds, more, more kind of like Beaujolais to some stuff that's made in that more, you know, Bordeaux style. Two things about that. When did you first start planting Cabernet Franc? 2006 was our first planting. Okay. And then um, uh, if you're in the tasting room right now, because I know your tasting room very well, because you're only 30 minutes away from my house. Uh, somebody says, okay, what is this wine all about? Give me give me a quick sentence. How do you describe Cabernet Franc to, uh, to a tourist that's coming in? Ooh, I mean, the one we're tasting today is so much different than other ones that we've made. I mean, today's is a little bit more focused. Um, I think I'll get into the kind of clone selection and rootstock in a little bit. But um, yeah, it's a little bit more focused and extracted than other vintages. But it's, you know, here in New York, we deal with vintage variation all the time. And I think as winemakers, we kind of constantly have to adjust to that um, saying, uh, you know, our standards should be quality, not you know, making the same exact wine every year because that, that would be impossible. <laughs> oh, you're actually, as I looked at all the wines, you're the darkest in color of all of the five wines today. And you're also the highest in alcohol at 13.7. We'll get back to you in a second, but Yancey, there you are. You know, you're, you're less, you're 20 minutes away from my house uh, uh, in New Paltz. Well, we'll call it New Paltz for my purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking over the Shuanggong Mountains, if you're all uh, climbers, this is the place to be. And grape growing in White Cliff. Uh, when did you start planting Cabernet Franc? We committed to it very early on in our many decades of, of growing. We first planted it in 1985 and we gave it about 10 years to see how it did. And then we decided to plant more. Um, and um, in, in fact, we've, we've been on board with it long enough that we've been founding members of the Hudson Valley uh, Cabernet Franc Coalition, which is a group of growers who are organizing around promoting the varietal as a real signature grape here in, in the Hudson Valley. Um, so we have um, close to 10 acres of it planted, I think. And um, it's, uh, we found great evolution in what we can do with it over time. Um, I can really remember back in the 90s struggling to get good color and um, to get fruit that would dominate the natural green pepper notes that Cabernet Franc tends towards. And um, there's just been so much research into rootstocks and that work on your site um, and the clones that will give us looser clusters and earlier ripening and um, more prominent fruit flavors, all the things that we need to manage the, uh, the canopy, strip leaves to maximize sun exposure. And all of this is really letting us ripen Cab Franc to just great flavors. 
Okay, which is the, the whole thing about uh, Cabernet Franc, everybody's talking about the cool climate. My God, here we are in, in all of our regions that we have that cool climate. Of course, uh, Cabernet Franc uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know, much uh, earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, so that's one of the, it's Cabernet Franc, and everybody can pronounce it as well. But can you tell me, you're in the tasting room, somebody comes up and says, they've never even heard of Cabernet Franc. What do you tell them? What, what's the style? That's why I call the words. Sorry. I tend to say that it's it's interesting to know that it's it actually came before Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a parent grape, so even though it's you know you may not have heard of it, it's it's uh, fundamental to fine wine making. And to me, it has a lot of the flavors of Cabernet Sauvignon without being as heavy, which means that it's very food friendly and um, you know goes as well with your pasta and red sauce as it does with your steak. We're going to come back to that food thing in a second. Uh, Aaron, I, I, I know you're here because I saw your, oh, there you are. Okay. He's in the lab. He's working. He's just taking a break here right now. This is the coffee break. Aaron, how, how much do you have up there? Uh, oh, by the way, the first two, if you haven't noticed, are Hudson Valley because it's home failed advantage. Uh, but then, you know, now we're moving upstate uh, into, the, into the Finger Lakes. What do you got up there, Aaron? In terms of, uh, of the style or? Well, no, actually, in 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 acreage right now, how, how much Cabernet Franc do you guys have? Oh, we have around uh, ten acres or so, okay. but we're plant. We established uh, three more acres two years ago, and then we're going to plant uh, another acre this uh, coming year. Okay, and the style. How would you describe the style? And I, I'm going to put it down as a New York State style, or if you will, in your case, Finger Lakes. Is there a Finger Lakes style of Cabernet Franc? Have we gotten that far yet? Well, you know, uh, we've really come a long way in understanding uh, what Cabernet Front does in the Finger Lakes and in the state as a whole. I believe that we are looking at the wines to be much more expressive of the fruit um, in regards to our unoaked. I think our, our unoaked Cabernet Franc is a, is a real prime example of what that represents. Um, I think understanding proper cooperage technique um, and just, you know, I've been in the Finger Lakes for almost 20 years now and seeing the arc of the cultural shifts um, is just pretty fascinating. So we're getting closer to like uh, a realization of what it is. So I think that's that's what's coming along is that we're all kind of fit. All the tumblers are going into the lock, which is exactly how I feel about it's exciting. Uh, and, and I'm projecting here right now that uh, a New York State Cabernet Franc will be selling uh, many, not all of course, will be selling over $100 a bottle, uh, maybe hundreds of dollars a bottle in the future. And so that's that's my opinion right now. Uh, but let's find out, Bruce, Bruce is uh, flying in from um, uh, Long Island. He's, fl he's flying right now from Long Island to the Finger, Finger Lakes or something to that effect. Bruce, how many acres do you have <clears throat> planted up there? So uh, right now we've got about a little over five acres planted. We got a, light, a late start because we um, were we not we weren't sure when we started uh, the vineyard in in '09 whether or not um, red varietals would would do that well in the Finger Lakes. So it was kind of a an experiment in '15 when we planted uh, blocks of Cab Franc Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. So we went with a with a test and found that the Cabernet Franc was consistent. It was easy to manage. If you ask our vineyard manager who's managed lots and lots of different varieties in the Finger Lakes, what is it about Cabernet Franc from just a growing standpoint? It's just very, very amenable to this climate. It's, it's disease resistant, it's canopy, seems to grow in a balanced fashion on our site. And, um, and we really love it. We're, um, uh, we think it's a, you know, if someone says, and what, what should they expect from a Cab Franc? I think it's a, a, a more food friendly, a more versatile wine, like Yancey said. And um, it, you know, it's slightly lower in alcohol than you find with Cabernet Sauvignons. And it's a lot more consistent and, and authentic at a price point than you'll get with Pinot Noirs. So um, we, we think it's got a great future here. Well, you're actually, before you got involved in all this, you're a businessman. So I guess you're making also calculations of, uh, do you think do you think what I just said, you're gonna see a $100 bottle of Cabernet Franc in New York State? You're gonna go with me on that? 
Yeah, maybe at an auction to benefit a very worthy cause. That's when you'll see that first hundred dollar mark uh, crossed at some point. Yeah. Well, that's what they that's what they said about the wines of California. I'm old enough yeah. to remember. Are you j joking with me? A California Cabernet at twenty dollars a bottle? What are you kidding? Uh, yeah. We've come yeah. a long way, baby. Uh, you know. So here we are, and and we have our Long Island rep. I hope I hope he's here. Kareem, I didn't see you uh, earlier, but is Kareem joining us right now? Hi. Okay. Is Kareem here? Yeah. Can you oh, hear me? Yeah, there you are. Okay. I, you're not on my list. Or, I mean, you're on my list. So you're 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 the guy from Long Island, uh, you know, who's going to tell us what's going on down there. Uh, how many how many acres do you have planted down? You got a lot of acreage land. Uh, at at Pamanac, we have about nine acres of Cabernet Franc planted. And 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 how would you describe the taste? Uh, you know, I mean, I think the the. Cab Franc, I think, is well known for its sort of pepper notes, um, the, the, the range from bell pepper to jalapeno to black pepper. Um, and, uh, and then you have um, good structure, maybe not quite as structured as Cabernet. It varies from year to year. Um, but uh, we, we, we grow several Loire varieties at Pamanac. We grow Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc. And Cabernet Franc, and that we just planted some Melon de Bourgogne, and the point is, um, in some years, the our Cabernet Franc is going to be, I think, more reminiscent of something you get from the Loire, but in other years, in the riper vintages, it's going to be more rem reminiscent of of some of the Bordeaux reds, and so, uh, um, it, it, as Matt said earlier, we definitely have vintage variation, and so, for example, the 18 Cabernet Franc we're going to taste from Pamanac today was definitely a lighter vintage for us, a cooler vintage. And you know the the resultant wine is is definitely a lighter style, but it's it's a very successful style. It's uh, delicate, pretty, feminine. All these adjectives with regard to um, you know a fun, lighter-bodied red wine. Uh, but we've also made Cabernet Franc that we give our grand vintage designation. That that's more of a structured, uh, uh, Van de Garde uh, uh, type of wine. Well, when my students ask me, uh, you know, about the club, you know, in my wine school, uh, you know, about Cabernet Franc, obviously we talk about the Bordeaux, we talk about the Loire Valley, uh, you know, and uh, I am now talking about New York State. Uh, and I hope that you understand, I, and you all have been doing this a while, but I mean, we're not, we didn't talk about Cabernet Franc 50 years ago or 40 years ago or 30 years ago. It wasn't on the radar. So to watch it come as far as it, it's come. So basically I say, I'm going to say medium style, medium to light, not medium to heavy. That would be, this is, I'm looking for words here right now. Low, lower in tannin than its friend Cabernet Sauvignon and higher in acidity, which I believe makes for a wine that's going to go really, really great with food. And I know a lot of you are out there, some of you already finished your five wines, but I'm going to go back to Matt now. The first wine that I have on my agenda is the Ben Marl. I hope that you all have the wines and I have the bottle here. Oh, that's the other thing too. I was going to talk. So our first wine, Ben Morrill, has got, uh, you know, a screw cap. And our last wine, uh, you know, uh, over at, um, at, at Kareem's place has got a screw cap. The rest of you got corks. We'll get back to that later on. But uh, Matt, take us through this wine. You, you, it's 100% uh, cap. Oh, this is the thing, too. I want to ask all of you. It's kept, This is 100% cap money front. Some of you are using Merlot. Some of you are not oaking the wine. Some of you are using American oak. And some are using French oak. This is this is sort of like what I'm trying to get to. So Matt, take us through uh, your your uh, 2019. So this vineyard was planted. It's a kind of a a bowl shaped um, south goes southeast south southwest facing slope um, at at Ben Marl. Uh, we planted it in 2015 uh, with two different clones, uh, clone 214 and 327, and we planted it on Riparia rootstock which kind of, I don't want to say dwarfs the vines, but um, it, it does limit its vigor because Cap Franc can be quite vigorous in the vineyard. Um, uh, this morning, if you see the image in front of you, uh, I went to a block of clone 336 on 3309 um, and took an average size cluster. And then I went through the riparia block and pulled an average size cluster. And um, you could just see how much more um, loose the 214 on riparia is, how much smaller the berries are, um, and then go down to the bottom and you can actually see the cluster weight. Um, this isn't an average of anything. It was just kind of me looking, okay, this looks a little bit like what everything else looks like in the vineyard. Um, but 
you know, kind of when you're planting, you know, all, all the sites, I want to say, especially here in the Valley, because this is where I grow grapes, but I'm sure everywhere else has, uh, you know, the same kind of things going on, but the soil structures change so fast in the Valley, um, not from vineyard block to vineyard block, but row to row a lot of the time. So, um, you know, choosing those right combinations for the style of wine that you want to make is just really super important. Um, with this, block in particular, we knew we wanted this to be, um, you know, our kind of more structured, higher end um, estate cab franc. Um, other blocks that we planted, we planted uh, more for rosé, so bigger clusters and, and such. Um, so this is all hand harvested. Um, and I want to say about 20% pullberry, which is this picture here, a little bit of the ferment. Um, and it is barreled down in mostly neutral 500 liter punchins um, and a little, I think maybe 10 or 15% uh, two year old French oak, all French oak. Um, and only around, I don't have my, my notes in front of me, but I want to say nine months. Um, and it's bottled unfined and unfiltered. So just kind of, I think, a, a real kind of. Um, pure expression of, of the variety. So, you know, we're talking about clonal selection and of course we don't get too geeky on here, but it's really, really important because I think including everybody that's on here right now, uh, you know, what the clones are, uh, w w did that come through Cornell? Did they, did they come up with the clones or did you come up with the clones? So just kind of talking to other winemakers, that's one thing I think in all of these panels, um, all of us winemakers kind of talk to each other and ask, okay. hey, what this, what that, um, especially from my experience, everyone's been really helpful and um, just kind of, oh, we've had issues with this or this seems to work. Um, and it, it was actually Michael at Whitecliffe was talking about uh, not so much the clone, but the, the rootstock of riparia, um, how, how it does dwarf the vine a little bit and it, it does help to ripen it a little bit faster. Um, so uh, you were talking about those kind of higher alcohols and, um, I kind of like if you're really proactive in the vineyard and you're getting your leaves removed early and shoot positioning and get it, getting really good sun exposure in there, um, you can you can pick wines that are ripe but also still fresh. Uh, which I, which yeah, did, you, did you open any of your wine? Uh, do you have a glass of your own wine? Okay, this is important. Okay, here you are. You're in the tasting room. You got the glass in front of you. Uh, uh, you know, um, you've just given me that thing. Taste the wine with me, please. Just smell it. What are you getting? Everybody's got the wine so we can all smell together, including the people that are watching. I get a lot of nice ripe kind of that raspberry, blackberry aromas in there. Um, and on the palate, what I really enjoy about it is that the acidity is really, really lively. Um, and it kind of keeps those tannins firm. And like you said before, you know, this is something um, maybe designed to be brought to the table. Uh, it's, you know, begging well, for something. I, I, I don't know. I'm asking any of the panelists if they have. I, my, my thing is, this is exactly what I'm looking for. When I say medium in body, uh, I think that the, the aromas that you're getting are fresh fruit. Uh, and uh, I get a little bit of that, um, uh, uh, as you just said, the raspberry kinds of things going on. I always just want to put my hand over the top. If you've never done this Israeli method, it does actually work. You open it up and you get much more aroma. And on the taste, cheers to everybody if you haven't tried it yet. Medium in body, uh, lots of fruit on the, on the palate. There's the acidity coming in right away, but it's not overpowering the fruit. And you can feel the tannins, but you know that they're soft tannins. They're not hard tannins. Uh, and drinkability, uh, I agree with you, uh, Matt. I, I might have this tonight uh, for dinner. And uh, I'm sure you've had this with other, uh, you know, with some food is you have a choice. Uh, I mean, we all have to eat and drink and we all have to eat drink our own wines a lot of the times. Any kind of food you go, you'd go, you put with your wine? I like anything on, it's cooked with charcoal. Cab Franc, I feel like is a, a really good fit. <laughs> it brings that, kind of ties the smokiness to the earthiness of the variety, um, you know, from vegetables to meats and things like that. Right, well, we'll come over. And I just want to mention again, first winery where I ever went. And of course, it, it, uh, it was another family running it, uh, you know, but uh, very, very, I'm still sure you're close to them as well, the Miller family. Uh, and uh, uh, and the oldest vineyard in the United States, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Ben Morrow. If you didn't know about it, that's where it is. The newest vineyard in the United States is uh, Whitecliffe. I'm only kidding, Nancy, but I'm coming back to you right now. Thank you, Matt. We're gonna get back on the tasting 
Uh, 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 Yancy, you want to try your wine as well now? Tell Actually, us what you get. Don't have it to hand. Okay. I'm sorry to say. So I'm going to look to yeah. you to just to describe the flavors uh, with uh, the vividness of having it in your mouth. But I, you're saying uh -huh. where the newest vineyard is uh -huh. is not far off because the vineyard that this wine comes from right. is our newest site. We we do farm over 30 acres in the valley and it's on three different sites. And uh, this is a vineyard that's been a stance 20 uh, and that is sort of remarkable to, to me about the wine is that um, it was second leaf. The, the grapes that uh, made this wine uh, were from vines that had just been in the, in the ground two years. And that's not what we usually do. You usually don't get uh, really good fruit that early, but it's a sign of how strong the site is. Wonderful sandy soils, um, uh, Knickerbocker, Husik, uh, very good soils. And a lovely steep slope. Uh, you'll have pictures, I think, that will we'll show this. Uh, the draining cold air down to the Hudson River, bringing up the uh, warm, warmer maritime breezes. Uh, um, and we actually won from these very young vines, the, the wine that we produced from it. Um, the site is also remarkable because it's drop dead gorgeous. It's got this view of the Catskills that inspired the first um, school of painting in America, the Hudson River School of Painting. And uh, we are gonna be opening a tasting room there soon as well, which uh, is exciting. There's, there's a picture I see. Um, my husband, very proud of the site uh, with the river behind him. And uh, it gives you a little a sense of the, uh, the slope there. And uh, there'll be another shot that shows, I think more the, the Catskill view in the distance. Um, but uh, here we go. It's a little scary to run a tractor on that site. And this year with all the rains we've been having, it's been particularly challenging not to slither down the muddy slope into the vines. Um, fun year, this one. Um, but um, the wine itself, um, we're very proud of it. It's uh, just got a, a lot going on in it. Fruit, tannins, acids, all those things that you want. And um, lovely balance of flavors. Well, Olana is a beautiful place to visit uh, in general. If you're in, uh, you know, in, in the area, everybody's got to go visit Olana and then the new vineyard. And when is the tasting room coming? Soon? This summer or next summer? Pandemic has really thrown a wrench in, in the works and slowed us way down in every right. possible way. And it's we're looking at uh, actually pouring from a farmer's market tent this year. Um, I think um, I'm... I'm almost 100% certain we'll be pouring in, August, in October there, but I think we may also have some dates in September. So well, people actually, should like check on our- Bring that up because it's in my hometown of Pleasantville that you're doing that, the farmer's market. What I'm getting in this wine for everybody that's on here, obviously the lighter color is probably coming from just being second leaf. Uh, and also the alcohol, uh, the lowest of all the wine today is 12%. And I, I'm getting more of um, a lighter style wine just in the smell. And would you guys all try it with me? Because I'd like to get some in, in, you know, input from some uh, of you, especially on a second leaf kind of situation. Soft, fruity, and the taste. I, I, I know for us on Long Island, 18, uh, 19 was definitely a riper vintage than 18. Um, so I don't know if that's contributing as well. This one's 17. Which, which is also another question about ageability. So now we have a four-year-old bottle of wine. Um, I, I would drink it now. Uh, I do see the potential. I've had Cabernet Francs that I know from New York that will age you know, uh, over five years and most likely some of them will even go over 10 years. It's just that the jury's out right now because there's not enough of them around. So I'm sort of curious, um, uh, um, uh, Aaron, do you have any comments on this wine as well as ageability of uh, Cabernet Franc in New York State? Yeah, this, I mean, this wine is very, very pretty. It has those, um, those really beautiful uh, aromatics that you get from a, a young Cab Franc. Uh, yeah, ageability, uh, that probably will do well for three to 
five more years. I mean, it's, you know, they, these vintages, because of the variability, um, just finding where that groove uh, is, where the wine kind of sits, um, is, uh, is always part of the trick. But yeah, it's a, it's a nice wine. Aaron, do you have any, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Bruce, do you have any questions or comments on, on this so far? I like these wines, all of them. I've tried them all and I think they're all great. So I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of put thumbs up uh, for all of them, actually. I mean, consistency with Cabernet Franc is what I think will put it in, uh, in, in the first rank for New York wines. Okay. Um, I'm getting a little cranberry, just so you know. That, that aftertaste is like, to me, that cranberry that's coming out. That's a positive, not a negative. Very, very low in tannins. Uh, uh, as, uh, you could drink it now or you could put it away. So, uh, you know, uh, Aaron, you're up now, buddy. Um, uh, you, we're back to you. We're going to Aaron on the right. Is that correct? Yeah, the answer we've done, Aaron, you're next. So tell us about, uh, tell us about this particular bottle. Well, this is our 2020 T23 Cabernet Franc, 100% um, Cabernet Franc. It was machine harvested. Uh, the fruit was destemmed on board. Uh, we have a newer Gregoire harvester so we can remove all the material other than grapes from the fruit. So it has just, you know, pure content in our, our uh, gondolas. Uh, the berries were not crushed. It was all the fruit remained intact when they went into the fermenters. We fermented them in one ton fermentation bins, um, utilizing carbonic, semi-carbonic um, maceration. So, you know, it, and it was only, we only pumped over the wine. So the the free run that broke the berries by the weight on the bottom of the bin, what was what we irrigated the wine with. And just this slow extraction and just getting those finer grain tannins, um, really keeping that uh, delicate framework in place. Uh, the, um, yeah, and then just the fermentation was pressed off around uh, two thirds of fermentation and was allowed to finish fermentation in stainless steel and then it underwent carbonic maceration in there. I think another really fascinating component with this wine is that because we have it in a pretty reductive environment, we retain a lot of the fermentation CO2. So there's quite a bit of residual CO2 in this wine as well, which is often not the case with red wines because barrel aging, it goes away and and not often CO2 seems to work with red wine because it can make the wine really angular uh, with the carbonic acid and the tannins. But um, this seems to frame it up really nicely and, and uh, uh, build a lot of unique structure to the wine. Well, I, that's interesting. I mean, the carbonic maceration, do you actually have another Cabernet Franc that you use it put in oak or is this, is this gonna be your style, unoaked Cabernet Franc? We make uh, three Cabernet Franc wines. One is a dry rosé, um, and then the other is our barrel aged Cabernet Franc, um, and that would be you know that's 100% barrel aged, and we'll play with between different amounts of time, whether it's nine months to 18 months in in cooperage. So what am I getting out of? Do you have a glass? Did they, did you were, were able to get a glass? <laughs> Sell some here. If you guys don't have any wine, I don't know what I can't help you on everything, you know. But this wine though. Very, very, it's, it's light in color. And uh, the first thing, and uh, you know, I, uh, again, because I, I cover all wines of the world, uh, this is a positive, it's not a negative, but I, that carbonic maceration coming through, uh, it's a, a 2020, the youth of it all. Uh, it's, I feel like I'm in your winery right now. I'm smelling the, the wine being fermented. And um, when I say not a negative, because I, when I say Beaujolais, I'm talking about Cru Beaujolais. I'm not talking about a Beaujolais or even a Beaujolais Village. I'm talking about and what's, what goes around comes around because I think that Beaujolais Cruz are some of the best wines in the world right now. And that's what I'm getting there, real fruity. And, then, and, and, and we talked about raspberry before with Matt, this is like coming out, raspberry, strawberries out of the glass uh, and unbelievable uh, 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 aroma and the taste. Everybody's tried the wine so far. I know that Bruce has already had the wines three times. Correct. A little tick Fresh. marks on, yeah. Fresh, lively. Uh, again, ready to drink. This wine, I, I, maybe that's what the way, Aaron, that's why, why you're making it that way. You have the barrel uh, aged one for something else. 
But uh, this I could see summer is still here. We're still in July. Um, this would be a great outdoor um, barbecue kind of wine. Uh, it, what, what, Aaron, what would you have with this? And I'll come back uh, to you in a second, Bruce. Well, um, yeah, the, it, with all those components and flavors that are there, like with that uh, carbonic character, like that, that unique um, benzyl aldehyde is that almond flavor that hits you way in the back there, real subtle in a young, young wine like this. We bottled this in May. I'd probably pair it with um, something that was a little easier to eat, maybe like a caprese salad. Um, if you're going to go for something a little heartier, uh, some bolognese would work as well. Just, it's a, it's a very versatile wine. Well, the wine, you put a little chill on it as well. It really focuses on that, that carbonic, um, and it can, it develops really interestingly as it warms up. So I just, yeah, lighter fare is a great, a great, uh, pairing. Very, very low in tannins. I mean, it's the lowest wine we've had now, uh, with the tannins, um, Yancey, you come in second on that one. Matt, you had a lot of tannins in your wine. That, by the way, tannin is good, so it brings it all together. But so far I've seen now uh, with the three of the five uh, producers here, different styles of making the wine, different clonal, uh, different uh, oak aging. Uh, and uh, um, it's, it's gonna be fascinating to see where we all end up. So like I'm talking 10 years from now with all of this together. So uh, we are Bruce, we are now with you and you're still in the Finger Lakes. Uh, tell, so, us a, t tell us a, bit, a little bit about uh, boundary breaks and um, here we go. Now, that's the other thing. Uh, you got 75 Cabernet Franc, 25% Merlot. Some of them are 100%, some of them are blended. What, what do we got here? So a um, little a quick history. I'll make it really quick, but um, Finger Lakes is a cooler climate and it really began uh, experiment, experimenting with European grape varieties in the late 70s and early 80s. A great many varieties were planted. Some worked. Most of them didn't work, particularly in the red category. A lot of Cabernet Franc was planted in the 80s and 90s, but the wines that were produced, I think, just did not meet everyone's expectations. So the attention kind of moved away from Cabernet Franc and the Finger Lakes. There's probably 300 acres, 350 acres maybe planted, which is a lot um, for this region. Um, what happened then was Cornell did some work on how to produce higher quality Cabernet Franc wines by starting in the vineyard. And that mainly had to do with early leaf removal, getting a lot of sunlight onto the fruit clusters early in their lives. That's a combination of getting rid of leaves and also positioning the shoots in such a way that there's very little to no shade on, on the fruit clusters. This was in 08 and 09. In 14, you mentioned, um, Kevin, that uh, you mentioned Cheval Blanc. Well, the vineyard manager from Cheval Blanc came to Cornell and talked about what they do at, in their Cap Franc vineyards. What they do is they remove leaves early. They are very careful with shoe positioning. And so what we heard from Cap Franc was, what the, was the same thing we heard from our own folks, uh, or what we heard from Cheval Blanc is what we heard from the folks at Cornell. And we said, okay, this is a style of wine that we think um, is a good fit for, for this, for us, certainly in this region. Um, our first vintage was 17. So we, this is only our third vintage. We blend Merlot with the Cap Franc because we think, quite frankly, the market out there is conditioned to a big red cab, Cabernet Sauvignon, and, and they, they just are, they need to be, we need to hold their hands a little bit as we move them in a direction where they can appreciate um, this style of Cab Franc from this area. So uh, we also make this very inexpensively. This is a, a 1995, uh, we can make it consist, this, the 19 is a style that we think we can make consistently year in, year out, even with the vintage variation we have around here. So we're, we're really happy with this wine. I'll taste it with us. You have, hopefully have a glass and tell us what we're looking at here right now. Tell them which lake you're on. Okay, this is um, Seneca Lake. We're on the east side of Seneca Lake. We're about four miles north of Aaron at uh, Lamero Landing. So the lake you saw in the background of his photo is the same one that you're seeing here in the background. Uh, that we're close to the water. Uh, that means in the wintertime, our temperatures are a lot warmer. Being on the east side means we get western, western uh, sun uh, longer into the, into the afternoon, so our fruit will get riper. And, and when it comes to fermentation 
practice is very simple, non-interventionist. We ferment in open top one ton bins uh, in oak for 10 months, neutral oak by and large. And then based on the, the, the Merlot we have and the, and the Cabernet Franc that we have, we, we blend until we think we have the right combination. This picture here shows a little bit for those of you who may not realize just how influential the deep lakes are here in the Finger Lakes. This is in the in uh, March of 2015 when everything was frozen except Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake. Seneca Lake is on the left, Cayuga on the right. The lakes are warmer and that's why they don't freeze and vineyards adjacent on the shores um, like those at Lamro, like ours, and on, especially on the on the eastern side, just benefit from a you know six to eight degrees of of, of warmer weather. If you have the wine there, can you taste your own wine? Yeah, you sure. I, I like uh, what I think about that. I get black cherry typically. I think that Merlot adds a nice mid palate mm -hmm. to this wine. There's a lot of um, of um, weight. I think that you might not always expect, the traditional consumer will not always expect this kind of, of mid palate. And you know, we, we, I'm here every weekend, every day, we taste this wine with a lot of people that come in that say they don't like red wines from the Finger Lakes. And I say, well, how many have you tried and have you tried this one? So I think we're in an educational um, uh, phase here with narrow-minded, biased, uh, red wine drinkers, and we want to change that. I, I, I again, uh, tasting this wine, uh, it's it's the one that to me is sort of the uh, you know medium, not light medium, but medium in body and depth. Uh, uh, lots of, of balanced, uh, integrated tannins. Uh, I totally agree with you on the black fruits. Uh, I, I I think um, uh, Aaron's wine had more of the red fruit kind of thing, and th these are more black fruits coming through, um, and then. It just the best. I have to say this about all the wines so far, and uh, and I'm going to say um, to, to to Kareem. I'm sure it's going to be with you as well. But they are all very likable. They are all easily easy to drink. Whatever, however you did it with whole berry fermentation, with oak, without oak, or whatever. Um, I, I just again, I, I, I my enthusiasm hopefully is coming through on this great variety in New York State. So, anybody have any comments uh, before I go to Kareem? Anybody want to, you know, say anything bad about Long Island? That was, that was a joke, guys. It's okay. All right. Because when I started, when I started studying wines, Long Island vineyards didn't exist. Uh, I'm that old, uh, and but uh, Kareem is the young guy with his family and his brothers, and we, we've, I think we've done this three times, Kareem. We've been together, so uh, you know, I know, I, and I think one of your pictures uh, you're, you're going to have on there is with the sorting table. And yeah. I'm hearing all these why it works, what makes it work is clonal selection. Uh, adding 25% Merlot, uh, you know, uh, and but now tell us a little bit more what you, you guys are doing there in, in regards to Cabernet Franc. You told us how many acres you have. Where's it going? Uh, there we go. Take us away, Kareem. Uh, so, what, I mean, I share your, very much share your enthusiasm for Cabernet Franc, Kevin. Uh, we, we think it definitely has a home on Long Island. Uh, I forgot who was saying that earlier, but somebody was talking about how happy uh, the vine is, you know, in, in the vineyard, when you see uh, the, the growth in the spring of Cabernet Franc, it's really, uh, uh, you know, it's the first, to, it's one of the first varieties to hit the top wire and so on. It, it just, uh, it, 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 it clearly thrives in the vineyard. And um, uh, Bruce brought up um, Cornell's uh, study um, and with regard to leaf removal, a practice we've long employed for prophylactic reasons to achieve the overarching goal of growing healthy ripe fruit there's no other way to make great wine you need to start with healthy ripe fruit so we were removing leaves for that reason to keep our our um, fruit healthy and clean with regard to powdery and it turns out there's this huge fringe be benefit with regard to to, to pyrazines i isomethoxy pyrazines did, did, did you already cover pyrazines did you? a little bit but you can continue so this is, I guess, um, for some people, they, I, believe it or not, this can be controversial because some people think that uh, if Cabernet Franc does not smell like bell pepper and jalapeno, that there's a problem. It doesn't have varietal character. Uh, our style, uh, since we're doing this practice anyway, we consider it a major fringe benefit 
they're re reducing the pyrazines. And, just, and one of the things that Cornell showed when they did the study is if you do leaf removal thoroughly and early in the growing season, you will accelerate the natural depletion of the pyrazines in the grape and the resultant wine. And that's a big deal because the pyrazines can be quite pronounced in Cabernet Franc. And to have, to have lowered them, you're, you're, I think you're producing a wine that's in balance. It, it, overall, it's in, in greater balance, or at least aromatically. And, um, uh, but we, 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 we love Cabernet Franc. Uh, I think it's great with uh, like shish kebab and shish tahu and grilled vegetables and things like that, like uh, uh, baba ganoush or, or, you know, an eggplant parm, stuff like that. And on Long Island, you can have it with some seafood, you know, with a, a tuna steak or even like a striped bass or something, depending on the style of the wine and so forth. Um, but so our wine that we're pouring today, the 18 Tomanac Cabernet Franc, is actually made from, you know, for us on Long Island 2018 was, was not the strongest vintage. It was more of a, uh, it was a cooler, uh, relative, somewhat wet vintage. So therefore a, a challenging vintage, but therefore a good example of what we can do even in, you know, one of our lesser vintages, so to speak. Um, and so for, especially for a vintage like this, and very, and even in a riper vintage for this label, this is our, like, our, our estate bottled version as opposed to our, our grand vintage label, which is also a estate bottled, but it gets the grand vintage designation. We make that in our, in our top vintages. But for, for this label, I'm deliberately looking for used French oak, which I have right here. Um, behind me. Uh, so I'm always looking for the oldest French oak barrels that we have for this wine because I very deliberately do not want to use uh, new oak for this wine. Um, and it often has this sort of like feminine, pretty um, delicate uh, character. And um, I, I mean, I could keep going, but I'll stop. No, no, I want you to try it with me though, because I, I found that the aromas of, of, of the, all, all five wines are quite different. Yours was a, a, a very, uh, I think, getting to that floral. I, I, and when you talk about the peppers and stuff like that coming through, mm -hmm. um, it's pretty intense. Uh, the the nose. Uh, and again, I tell everybody, do it this way because you'll get it. You'll get you know a lot more out of it. Because that was the, that was the uh, problem with Cabernet Franc um, in the early days, uh, um, uh, of, of not just in New York but uh, everywhere, of getting of uh, that. Um, pepper, green, pe green bell pepper that, uh, you know, I, I remember Monterey County in California, uh, the, the, they had to pull out all the red vines, Cabernets, because that's all it tasted like. And that's not what I want in a wine. I want to have a wine to go with my, my peppers or something to that effect. <laughs> this is a uh, very spicy, spicy. And uh, well, again, uh, you were talking about oak and I, I don't think anyone here, I'm going to make sure that this is correct since you're all on the panel. No one is, here is using new oak. Am I correct? Did anybody? throw that in, is that correct? Okay. We have a little bit of new oak in ours. Uh, it's a blend of Hungarian and American, and there's right. a little new, but not a lot. Okay, so if I were to break it down, uh, let me continue on uh, this wine uh, with Karim. Um, did you taste the cream with me? I don't, I'm, 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 I'm watching you. I don't know if you tasted it yet. I, I, I tasted it. Um, I think, um, yeah, spicy. There's definitely, you know, some of those pepper notes in there. I also like this particular vintage, this wine. I think there's a bit of like a sour cherry thing going on. Um, it's cherry, but it's not like a very ripe cherry character. And you're getting the, some of that acidity there, uh, which, you know, this is a great wine for now, for the summer. You put a slight, I, I think that goes for virtually all of these wines. You put a slight, especially the ones that have a, a touch of uh, CO2 still there, put them in a in the, in the fridge for half an hour before you have lunch on your deck or something. And uh, at this time of year, they're great. And they're all great autumnal wines too, I think. I remember when that was a sacrilege, you know? What? Putting a red wine in the refrigerator? Are you kidding with me? You put ice in your red wine? What are you, nuts? Yeah. Uh, we've come, we, like I said, we've come a long way in all of this. And Rebecca, you're my voice of God, uh, meaning that you've been, you've been looking at, oh, Patri Patricia's got lots of questions here. Uh, and I, I, and I can't read them all on the bottom, but Rebecca, uh, you can actually come on board again, Rebecca. You don't have to be the voice. You can tell us if what, uh, some questions that we have. 
Yeah, well, I'll stick with the voice. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave the visuals to, to you all, to the professionals. So we do have a question um, coming in from Andrew. Uh, if Kevin, if you could uh, give us some comparisons with Bordeaux, Loire, Sancerre, Chile, uh, something of that. Yeah, I, I don't have much on. I don't have that much on Chile. Uh, it's it's not a major um, a grape in the sense of. I mean, they, they, like like Chile sort of owns Cabernet Sauvignon. And Sauvignon Blanc, if you want to take a look at it, uh, you know, of course there is Cabernet Franc there. Um, Bordeaux, um, again, it was always a blending grape. That's how I always remember Cabernet Franc, never as an individual uh, grape uh, on the label. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it adds, you can see, actually, we're having these wines, you can see what it can add to a Bordeaux. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, it, it, so it's, it's, there's not, when I mentioned Cheval Blanc before, in Saint Emilion, you're going to find basically Merlot and uh, Cabernet Franc. You're going to find very little Cabernet Sauvignon. So if you like those wines, and I think the biggest thing that's happening in Bordeaux right now is uh, Saint Emilion. In the Loire Valley, the Chinon, I mean, I've been drinking those wines um, and they're on my original Windows in the World wine list, uh, you know, and, but again, getting people, people do think of the Loire, this is actually interesting because in New York state, they think of white wines. Right, and of course, in, in the Loire Valley, it's seventy five percent white. Why do I want to try a red wine from the Loire Valley? Uh, and uh, uh, but um, so what? Uh, that's a good question because I'm comparing these wines. Uh, uh, I have a very, I guess, it, what it, it's international palate, and uh, these are standing up, and they're still in early. It is what I'm hearing from everybody. This is still early stages. Uh, and Bruce, just so you know, I, I mentioned this before that there's. You know, that $100 bottle of wine, I, I, it might be at an auction, but I'll tell you what, when you go take a look, and I'm suggesting to everybody here, go take a look at uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the most expensive Cabernet Francs uh, in, in the world. And I just mentioned there's one from Austria right now that's like $740 a bottle. But you're also going to find Antonori in, uh, the, uh, in Tuscany. Uh, you're you're going to find all, all of these wines, even up... There's a place called Niagara. You guys know where, where, know where Niagara is, you know, up in that area? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a bottle of wine selling right there for like uh, $140 for a Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. So, if they, you know, I'm saying, and it, it, yeah, just everybody just raise your price up to $100 and just make me look good, okay? So um, I hope that answers the question. But uh, the concept of world class, uh, and that's, uh, you know, there's no doubt we, we could talk about Riesling, uh, and we should. Uh, it, but Riesling, the, this Riesling from New York State uh, is world class. It, it's up there with Germany. It's up there with Alsace. It's up there, uh, you know, with Australia. Uh, and and I feel the potential of this wine really much stronger than I've ever felt it before. I hope that answered that question. But do, you got some more for our panelists. Actually, we're, we um, most of Patricia's were were wonderful uh, comments um, that we can scroll through the chat. Um, but uh, everyone is very uh, impressed with the wines. If you have a chance to take a peek in the chat, uh, lots of great conversation there. Um, but Kevin, if you'll kind of continue the convo here, we'll yeah. I'll keep you posted if more uh, Q and A pop in. Okay, maybe people are drinking too much. Maybe they blended them all together to make their own New York State blend, which is an interesting thing. If because I think I'm pretty sure that all of you are true to your uh, appellation. So all the Finger Lakes are coming from the Finger Lakes, all the Hudson Valley is coming from the Hudson Valley and all Long Island is coming from Long Island. But I also know that blending is done uh, between different regions. Uh, I don't, I not forgive my ignorance. Uh, does anybody know of people that are blending in like a little bit of Long Island into Hudson Valley, into the Finger Lakes? Anybody uh, with the Cabernet Franc I'm talking about? Any experimentation? Anybody can go have another glass of wine. So here, here at Ben Morrill, we make a New York State Cab Franc. Uh, it really depends on the vintage. Um, you know, we have uh, our estate vineyards. We have about four acres. Only two of those are in production. Um, and then we have another six acres planted off the property of Cab Franc. So we're, we're purchasing Cab Franc from the Finger Lakes and from uh, the North Fork of Long Island in some vintages. Um, so depending on the vintage, you know, um, we're, we're blending those as a, a New York State appellation. Um, other times it's strictly Finger Lakes or strictly North Fork of Long Island. Um, but it is really, I, I guess this is maybe where I started in the, um, in the beginning of this, this whole thing is just, how different the regions are. And, and when you're working with fruit from Long Island, 
uh, versus working with fruit from the Finger Lakes or, or here in the Hudson Valley, just how they're treated. Aaron was saying that kind of, um, you know, really gentle, just kind of wet the cap um, approach. And, um, you know, we find with stuff from Long Island, we're doing a little bit more of uh, multiple pump overs a day, tank ferments, not that really open top fermenter um, style of thing. So it, um, I guess this uh, panel of grapes really kind of, <laughs> it's a good example of all of that. It's also, as Kareem was saying, just like a really good example of like, if you're really proactive in the vin vineyard, um, we as winemakers and vineyard managers know 2018 was not an easy year to, to, to grow grapes here. Um, and it was across New York. It wasn't just isolated to Long Island or the Valley or up in the Finger Lakes. It was, it was just a really wet harvest. And, um, you know, that, that 2018 from Pominok is just a great example of, you know, get in there, be proactive. It's a variety. I think it is a, a grape growers variety, Cabernet Franc. It's something that uh, you really got to be doing due diligence in the vineyard. Um, but when you are, you can make something that's just really pretty and floral and, and you know, not not something that's, you know, hammering, hammering you over the head, but really food friendly. And um, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's a great lineup that kind of oh, expresses oh, 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 the oh, differences. Yeah. The, the reason I bring this up is, uh, you know, in California, and I, I do, you know, a lot of our writers that are out there right now, I know Linda with our Hudson Valley Wine Magazine is listening, but sometimes I got to talk about other areas because look at the North Coast App Appalachian, you know, in California, I mean, they're blending in from Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino and Lake County and coming up with a great bottle of wine. Uh, I find it, um, I find it interesting that that could, I mean, there's not, I don't think there's enough going around right now. Uh, I don't know. I haven't heard anybody tell me more than 10 acres. Am I correct of, of plantings uh, so far today? So that's a lot and not a lot if we're going to be uh, going through that. Anybody else on blending from different regions from Hudson Valley, Finger Lakes? Uh, um, um, Long uh, oh. Our, um, the White Cliff does have a little bit of Merlot in it and that would come from Long Island. Um, and I we, we take the same approach as Matt. You know, our, our focus is New York wines. Uh, we love to work exclusively with Hudson Valley fruit, but we've never felt that that was, uh, um, you know, what we had to do. Um, and we, we like to blend. Um, I, from what everybody's been saying about uh, the food friendliness though, I, I, to me, that's one of the most prominent things about Cabernet Franc is, uh, how easy it is to pair with uh, with foods. You know, Kareem brought up uh, Baba Ganoush and we tend um, in the Moliore household to go for the pastas and the red sauces, but it, it works with what you want to eat. That's, a, that, <laughs> I mean, I'm in the Hudson Valley, so I have this internet issue as well, going in and going out. Uh, but um, are you still there, Nancy, or not? I, I am. Okay, because I, I wanted to say something because, you know, the, the, for, as a writer, most important thing uh, I can say, if, if I had never planted grapes, I could have never written any of the wine books that I've written. And I want everybody to know that I'm a five-time failure uh, here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I was once, I had one success. I made one wine, Chardonnay. Uh, and I still have the bottle from 1984, if anybody would like to buy it. Maybe that's the $100 bottle, Bruce, you're talking about. I'll, I'll do it at auction. But growing Merlot, and I, I grew Cabernet Franc, and of course I wanted to do everything organically. We haven't discussed that, which uh, you know uh, uh, we don't have any time to discuss that. But I'll, 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 I'll uh, we got we got a few more minutes here right now, so I'm gonna may, maybe close out. Nancy, any any uh, last minute thoughts about life? <laughs> talk about the Olympics. Uh, uh, you want to talk about the smoke from Oregon that is above us uh, here in the Hudson Valley? Uh, mm -hmm. Any? last minute parting statements. I think we should do the opposite of a rain dance uh, here in the Hudson Valley. We, we want less, less rain um, and uh, a nice dry, hot August to make okay. a great Cab Franc for this year. Matt, I'll go to you, your Hudson Valley, go ahead. Last minute things to want to tell anybody. Um, I'm I'm going to deflect my answer to Kareem because he could talk a little bit about it. I saw it in the Q and A about screw caps, um, but both of our wines ha have screw caps on them, and I know Kareem is a little bit more well versed in it. Um, but I'm 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 a huge fan of screw caps and, and the idea that 
you know, we grow in a climate that, um, especially here in the Valley, you know, we're chasing fruit um, at the end of the season. Um, and I think the best way to do that is chase fruit at the beginning of the season. But, uh, you know, some years don't, don't allow for, for really big development. And we found that screw caps just really kind of help just capture it and keep it there for a while. Um, and I, I noticed the, the diam corks, I forget who had the diam corks, but those two seem to be doing a really good job. But closures, I think, sometimes are a not so talked about. <laughs> but far I, I, can, I can come into that because Kareem, Len Thompson said not to talk to you about the, the screw caps because it will be another hour show. I don't know what that means. There's inside. I, I would just like to make this statement real quickly because I do have to close out, but Kareem, you'll get a chance to say something. Um, so the bottom line in the world, in the world is 90% of all wines made in the world today are meant to be drunk within one year. Therefore, 90% of all wines can have screw caps with absolutely no problem. Another 9% uh, of all wines should never be aged over five years. So that's 99% of all wines should be consumed uh, you know, within five years. Well, we got the 1%. Okay, I can go with a cork with that. And I just had a 60 year old bottle of uh, Burgundy and the cork crumbled and everything. Of course, it only lasts 35 years. My cork just lasted, but the wine was a Grand Cru Burgundy. It was spectacular. That was just uh, last month. And you know, I should all become my friends because I'm trying to drink up all my wines in the cellar. But uh, I will come to you, um, uh, Karim. Uh, you have one final statement? Uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, thank you for covering the screw caps for me. Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Len is very happy with that. Um, just quickly, uh, our Cabernet for, and, and Pomanoc in general is in a state winery. And so our wines are, are, are all 100% estate wines, uh, almost always. Um, uh, I just want to say one thing about, like when we talk about the diversity across the state, I, I, uh, I agree. On the other hand, I just want to make a point. Uh, I'd like to make, you know, my mother is from the, from the Pfalz in Germany, and I've been there many times. And I like to make the analogy this, from, with New York to Germany, uh, the same way there's diversity among the Rieslings and the other wines grown in, in Germany between the Pfalz and Baden and Mosul and, 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 and the Rheingau and so on. Uh, I think it's the same in New York, whereas, uh, but we're all a cool climate. And so while there is of course inherent dif differences and, and diversity in the wines, there's a much greater difference when you go to other parts of the world, to the hot climates of the world, or you go to California and Australia and Chile and so on. And so um, I think that these, uh, these wines, uh, what they have in common is, is moderation, they have moderate alcohol and they have the great proclivity for food. I mean, they're, they're, they're all food wines. And, and I think that's uh, something to celebrate about New York wines is that they're, uh, they, you know, I think there's been a backlash against the alcohol having, like the pendulum has hit the wall with alcohol and it's swung back to center and the center is where New York is. And I think um, that's fun and exciting for us. So thank you. Next time that you're up to visit Auntie and I in New Paltz, by the way, it's New Faults, okay, is the French Huguenots who settled here in 1677. And Leon Adams, who wrote the book Wine of America, said this is where it all started. Of course, it wasn't true, but it really sounds good, doesn't it? Aaron, I, got, I, I, I know you got to go back to work because you're, you're in the lab. Some final parting notes? Well, I think this upcoming vintage is going to be a true New York vintage in that we do not know what we're going to get, um, which is one of the more exciting reasons why I think we're doing such great work in the Finger Lakes with all the wines we're producing is that our, um, our Yankee ingenuity really uh, strives to uh, benefit everybody. So yeah, that's, I'm, I'm excited. I always love a challenge. Um, it's great when it's a it's a great vintage. It's great when it's a, uh, a difficult one, but uh, yeah, here's some more excitement. Thank you. And then uh, um, uh, uh, Bruce, you get the final word, man. It's uh, I guess I hope the folks here on the call will feel if they're uh, serving wine in a restaurant or, or, or um, selling wine in a store, feel more confident with a hand sell. Our red wines from the Finger Lakes, for, for whatever reason, are still hand sells. And I hope today you get a feeling that um, these are all great wines and you should feel very confident hand selling them out there and get it into people's glass. That's all I would ask. Uh, cheers. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah. Uh, thank you to all of my panelists. Thank you to everybody who has uh, uh, spent an hour with us, a little bit more than an hour, but uh, it's, uh, it is exciting. And uh, 
uh, as a New Yorker and I'm staying here. I'm not going anywhere and I've been everywhere. I want to stay here. So uh, thank you for coming and uh, um, uh, see you all. I'm looking for a great vintage in 2021 and I'll all come and visit and try the ones. You all have a pleasant rest of the summer. Thank you. So long, everybody. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks to all of you for attending and to Kevin, Yancey, Matt, Aaron, Bruce, and Kareem for a terrific session. Um, I did notice there were two questions that, that were lingering in the Q&A and we'll be sure to get those um, emailed out to the panelists and get those um, back to you shortly. As a reminder, we hope you will join us for our next upcoming event, which uh, should open the conversation into a very pertinent topic, wine and a healthy lifestyle. Uh, this session will be on Tuesday, August 17th at 11 o'clock a.m. Thank you so much and have a great evening.